Robinson with the Santa Barbara County Trails Council. And I'm really happy today to be here with Sandy Brown, the author of a new book on the California Missions Trail uh, in, in California. And just as a preamble, I wanted to kind of explain why is the Santa Barbara Trails Council here uh, talking about a book that's 800, I mean a trail that's 800 miles long when we only have 100 miles of it here in Santa Barbara County. And you have to go back about 49 years is the Trails Council wrote a report, uh, about a 40 page report on a countywide trail system, a coastal trail, and mission to mission trails. So that was a vision established when I was in college, so it's a long, long time ago. And we've just been working away at all those trails over the years, getting closer and closer. And back in 2016, we tried to jumpstart uh, something this century with a symposium at Santa Barbara Historical Museum. And a gentleman named Butch Briery, who had practically the only book on how to walk uh, this trail published, uh, came and uh, gave a talk. and. We're really enthusiastic, thought things were gonna happen right away, but quiet, quieted it down. A year later, I applied for a grant to the National Park Service, and it was to do wayfinding for the California Missions Trail and the other trails in the area. And as we worked on it, we said, okay, let's see. Coastal Trail, state agency. The Anza Trail, federal agency. California Missions Trail, <laughs> where are they? We couldn't find anybody. And so we convened a small group of interested people in town. And so there was interest in Santa Barbara. Matter of fact, the Santa Barbara Missions Foundation is in Santa Barbara. And of course, the queen of the missions is in Santa Barbara. And, you know, we just kind of had to back burner the whole idea because there was no organization. And then um, Sally uh, Sheridan, who's in the back corner here, was traveling in Europe and she picked up a book on the Camino Santiago mm -hmm. and came back and said to me, Mark, this is a fabulous book. You should see the maps. It's a British publishing company. They did a first class job. If we had a book like this for the trail, we wouldn't even need an organization. It'd be just so cool. <laughs> and I'm like, Sally, you're just like so creative, but who's gonna fly over from England to write a book about an unmarked trail that's granted 250 years old, but um, you know, not that famous. And um, she persevered, and one day I got a call and said, hey, the author, Sandy Brown, lives in Seattle. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. He was born in California. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Grew up in San Diego. Oh, well, that's <laughs> perfect. And his uh, ancestry came from Mexico to San Juan Capistrano, and married into Native American tribes, uh, tribe members there. I'm like, oh, oh, that's too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, things move forward. Sandy uh, was very, very interested, but he said, you know, Mark, I'm doing three books on a pilgrimage from Canterbury to Rome. Um, you know, I'd like to squeeze you in somewhere, but you know, it's going to be a while till I finish those three books. And I'm like, ah, oh, geez, you know, when, when can we get this started? Because you know, my grant's going to expire. I can't, you know, fit that timeline or anything. And uh, this was like the very end of uh, 2019. And in March <laughs> of 2020, Sandy wanted to fly to England to work on his projects. But guess what? Yeah. <laughs> he couldn't leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> How lucky could we be? <laughs> so, uh, Sandy has a different story to tell, but I like this one. So, um, anyway, take it away, Sandy. Thank you so much, Mark. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate it. It's so nice to be here tonight. I love Santa Barbara. And the brain power and human power behind this resurgence and behind the California Missions Trail is a fellow named Mark Wilkinson and a woman named Sally Sheridan. And so the heart of it is actually right here in Santa Barbara. There are other organizations, so I'll talk about them in a minute, uh, that are important in the process. 
but I wouldn't be here without these two people. And I wouldn't be standing in front of this wonderful book. And I told my publisher, Jonathan Williams of Cicerone Press, that this is my favorite book that I've written. I've written six guidebooks. And the reason is that this is partly my history too. As Mark already mentioned, my family is interconnected with this. But also, as I biked the mission trail twice, north to south, south to north, and walked it once, north to south, I became part of the network of people that includes trail angels and mission ambassadors. And one of those mission ambassadors is here tonight. And I'm not going to embarrass her just yet, but I will embarrass her in a moment. <laughs> so, as Mark also said, the Missions Trail has been around for a long time, not just since the missions. The Native Americans walked between the tribal areas on trading routes for centuries, actually millennia. And then as the Padres arrived, first with Junipero Serra in 1769, they didn't accidentally go from point A to point B they followed existing routes with Native American guides. And it's possible to tell the whole mission story and miss what, at least in my mind, is the most important part. And that is the people to whom the missions were oriented, to whom they were directed. And there is a forgotten California story that is written between the lines of the missions that this book helps to uncover. So sometimes the padres are the key elements and the key actors for this book, in part because of my own background, in part because of our conversation that's happened over the last 10 years or so, the Native American heroes and heroines of the missions are highlighted. And the stories of the transition in the most important century of California history, those stories are told. What's the most important century? Well, it's our century, right? Because we're alive now. I believe it's 100 years between 1769 with Junipero Serra and the Portola expedition that began at San Diego, went up to Monterey, and that expedition, uh, expedition in 1769. And in 1869, I'm going to test your knowledge. The key event that happened in 1869, anybody want to hazard the guess? Is it the gold rush? The gold rush it was a few years before that, but you're close. It was the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. And what that meant was east to west suddenly was available with a train ticket and Americans poured into California. My ancestors didn't take the train. They walked from Mexico to Mission San Juan Capistrano and then they settled there. When I go to Mission San Juan Capistrano, I can meet with members of my family, the Nieblis family, that are part of the Hakachaman tribe, and also the Gabrielino tribes. But it's quite a story. Many people don't realize that Marin County, for instance, is named after Chief Marin, who was a member 
are a part of the San Francisco mission and then the San Rafael mission. Do you know Stanislaw County in California? That's named after a Native American who rebelled against the Padres at Mission San Jose. Oh. Did you know that? No. And uh, no. so there's quite an interesting story there. One of the biggest Indian revolts was at Mission Santa Barbara, Mission Santa Inez, and Mission La Parisina. And it happened not during the Spanish era, but during the Mexican era. As we talk about the Native Americans and Spanish history, we have believed or we've given the idea that the Native Americans were sort of docile and they didn't know well enough what their best interests were. That's not the story. It's a way more interesting and multi-layered story. And as I researched this, I realized that that story is not very accessible to people. So I highlight a few individual stories to tell about that. For example, you probably do know the story of Juana Maria. Do you? She, uh, maybe you know the Blue Dolphin book. That's a story of the Native American woman who accidentally was abandoned on the Channel Islands for 18 years. She was then brought to Mission Santa Barbara. She became part of the mission there, and she's buried at Mission Santa Barbara. It's an incredible story. So there are many, many stories like that. And the book strings them along geographically in the 800 miles of the Missions Trail. This is the Missions Trail, right here. So you know from the fourth grade, State of California Public Schools, that the farthest north mission is Sonoma, which is north of the Bay Area in wine country up there sort of by Napa Valley. And then the route continues on from <coughs> San Rafael and you have the choice of taking the boat from uh, Larkspur to San Francisco or walking across the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> I've walked it once and biked it two times. What an amazing experience, mm -hmm. and a little bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, on the bike, I was going faster than the cars who were in a traffic jam <laughs> there that day. <laughs> so then you follow down the peninsula, across the Dumbarton Bridge, or take the Bay Area Trail, that's an option, to Mission San Jose, then you cross Santa Clara Valley, a.k.a. Silicon Valley, to get to Mission Santa Clara at Santa Clara University. And you can do that about 75% of the way on hiking or walking, biking trails. Guadalupe River Trail and the uh, other trail also. The, I want to say the Gold Creek Trail. I don't know if that's true. Then you cross the Santa Cruz Mountains and come down to Santa Cruz. If I turned this on and showed you the pictures of walking from Santa Cruz to Capitola, how many have been to Capitola? Okay, some of you have. I think as a Seattleite, that's what we call people from Seattle, that Capitola is the cutest beach town in California. Mm. So you can walk there and you know there's a new trail being developed that's the old railroad bed mm -hmm. that went Santa Cruz to Watsonville. So because of the brilliance of people like Mark and Sally, we are aware of these multi-use trails and the other options. The, uh, 
dirt path and gravel road trails that we work to uh, to connect them. And so from Mission Santa Cruz to go across to Mission San Juan Bautista, do you know that was the capital of the Mexican government in Alta, California? Mm -hmm. And there are buildings around there that date almost to the Mission era, early 19th century. Mm -hmm. And then you can walk across uh, the Salinas Valley and go to the kind of nice town of Monterey and the kind of nice world-class uh, aquarium in Monterey. But then you walk over to Carmel, which is the really nice, cool <laughs> town in that area. And super nice. Because actually, again, if I had the screen here, I would show you on this little blip, if you're on your bike, you can ride the 17-mile road. 17 mile drive which I have not been to all of the Oceanside roads in the world but I predict somebody will someday go to all of them and when they do they'll say 17 mile drive across or around Monterey Peninsula is world class it's hard to walk it because it's long but you can bike there and they charge cars on that road that follows the ocean, but you do it free on your bicycle. <laughs> so it's a great track. And you get, you know, we're starting to correct, or connect some of these incredible routes in California. Then you go up the Salinas Valley. Mission Soledad is, uh, you know, Soledad means solitude. And sure enough, it's very quiet out there around Solid. It's on the 101, but uh, it's even so, it's quiet. But you think it's quiet there. Keep going to King City. You cross the 101 there, and you go up the Holon grade into Fort Hunter Liggett. And you might recognize the scenery because it was in the TV series Rawhide. That's where they filmed mm -hmm. many scenes from Rawhide. Mm -hmm. And they're in what once was the William Randolph Hearst estate is Mission San Antonio de Padua. The only thing mm -hmm. nearby is behind a chain link fence, the uh, cantonment area of Fort Hunter Liggett. Otherwise, you're in pristine wilderness, mm -hmm. California mm -hmm. at its virtual original state. So then you continue on down, actually upriver, into the lower Salinas Valley. And I don't mean to criticize California, but in other parts of the world, when you go upriver, you go to the upper valley. Here you go upriver on the Salinas River to get to the lower Salinas Valley. <laughs> and it's only because it's downhill on the map you know, right here. And that's remote between Holon, which is a ghost town, and Bradley, which has a used Chevy dealership and nothing else. <laughs> there is uh, just open country. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't know it in the Los Angeles basin, uh, or even in beautiful Santa Barbara, that you could be in the middle of nowhere, a couple hundred miles away. Even the 101 doesn't go that way. So we continue on to Mission San Miguel, which has original paintings made by the Native Americans in the original mission building that has been restored after earthquakes and stuff. And continue on, and now we get into God's country, Santa Barbara County. <laughs> <laughs> so after mission, well, Paso Robles or Robles, depending on your 
Spanish abilities. You get to Mission San Luis Obispo. And I have to say, I love urban spaces. And what they did when they daylighted the river there is they opened up a plaza in front of the mission. Mm -hmm. And you can sit down for lunch right on the foot of the doorstep of Mission San Luis Obispo. It's, it's a beautiful urban space under the trees there. Continue on, and I'm told that Pismo Beach is not that exciting, nothing to brag about. But for me, I didn't know that. I'm from Seattle. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, it's a fabulous um, beach. And then you continue up through the capital of Santa Barbara County, Santa Maria. And then over the hill, into Lompoc, the Harris Grade. It's a tricky place mm -hmm. to walk. It's even harder to bike, <laughs> but sadly it's the only way to cross the mountains. We have a mission ambassador through the California Mission Walkers who will set out signs for you saying, careful, drive safely, a walker is walking to the mission. And so then you come to Mission La Purissima, a state park. Continue on, you get to Solvang. I guess tourists like to go to Solvang. <laughs> and it must be because of the windmills. And it's a cool place. Kind of like Leavenworth, Washington for me. And, um, and then from Solvang, you go up over Refugio Pass. And this is where it gets fun, bikers. You have not been alive until you ride your bike down the Refugio Road. Yeah. And you're going from, let's just say it's 2,000 feet elevation to sea level. Nothing to complain about. It's a beautiful, amazing ride. You come then to, um, where am I? Then you climb the hill from Solvang and you come to Refugio Beach. And you know these areas, uh, Refugio State Park, then El Capitan State Park. And if you know it very well, you know the only route between El Capitan State Park and the uh, Baccarat um, Posh Hotel it's Highway 101, mm -hmm. or the train, or if the tide is low. If the tide is low, you can walk from El Capitan or to right. Haskell Beach. You start at a plus one tide or lower, mm -hmm. two hours before the tide. And what you're walking on, Debbie, am I right? Mm -hmm. You're walking on pretty amazing. I'm getting tingles <laughs> as I'm saying this. You're walking on pristine beach that the average Santa Barbara resident may or may not know is available if you can read a tide chart. It's fabulous. And then we come to um, the queen of the missions, Santa Barbara. Need I say more? <laughs> and after Santa Barbara, there's this bit of coastline where you're never farther than the stone's throw from the sea. And to me, that's fabulous. And hats off to the people that made that trail uh, that goes next to one on one. You're safe as a biker or as a walker to get, basically to get all the way from Santa Barbara, Mission Santa Barbara to Mission San Buenaventura in Ventura. Mm -hmm. So I'm going in great detail, but uh, from Ventura, then you go across the Simi Valley, you cross over Santa Susana Pass into San Fernando Valley. Mission San Fernando, then Mission San Gabriel, then Mission San Juan Capistrano, which makes my heart beat uh, faster, and then you come to the coast. And from for the last 90 miles or so, 
you're in places like Encinitas, Carlsbad, Del Mar. These are great places. And you're walking with the ocean at your right hand if you're going north to south. You're visiting Mission San Luis Rey, mm -hmm. and you're visiting then the end point, Mission San Diego, which is the starting point of Junipero Rosero. Mm -hmm. So it's quite the amazing trail. And during this journey, you have history at your fingertips because every mission represents not just Spanish history or Mexican history. Every mission was built by Native Americans. And at San Juan Capistrano, you can see Native American fingerprints in the adobe bricks. Mm -hmm. I was telling Father Tom of Mission San Buenaventura today that you know, we clergy, I'm a Methodist pastor and he's a Catholic priest. We may want to take credit for the buildings that we built, mm. but none of the priests did 40,000 adobe bricks that would go into a standard mission building. It's the Native Americans. Their art is there, their story is there. In many cases, the mission preserves their culture so that it it exists and evidence exists of it to, till today and on into the future. And speaking of that, for instance, at Santa Ines, there's the soon to be open um, museum and interpretation center of the Santa Ines band of Chumash Indians. And that's gonna be a jewel for people to see what Native American history is like and what Native American cultures are like then and today. So I am very delighted to be able to present this hiking and biking itinerary. 55 days of hiking, 16 days of biking. If you're in a hurry or you'd like to bike, it's a great bike route. If you love to walk, it offers an unparalleled opportunity in California. How do you do that? If you look in the back of the book, there's an appendix that is a trip planner that has the distances between lodging. There are campsites, there are uh, hostels, and there are hotels. And a few of the retreats, or a few of the missions, have retreat centers. And available to you is the 1,200 member California Mission Walkers group. And the Mission Walkers have a network of mission ambassadors mm -hmm. and trail angels. So when I walk the mission, I needed some place to say Golita. And heaven help me, I met this amazing person by the name of Debbie Goodman, who let me stay in her daughter's bedroom <laughs> overnight and then drove me back and forth to the trail. This is Debbie right here. Yay. Yay. Mission Ambassador for Mission Santa Barbara. And Debbie, this is for you. I hope you haven't bought one yet. That's for you for free. I bought free. one, but I wanted to buy one for each one of my kids, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, for Christmas presents. So. And I want to say thank you to you for hosting me and the my many pleasure. things you did on my stay. And you're not just yourself and wonderful. To me, you stand for the Mission Walkers team who can help by their generosity to make walking the missions trail possible. I am open for questions. In the meantime, I want to say thank you very much for being here this evening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Debbie. Question, north to south or south to north? Okay, that's a good question. Now, in my opinion, if you live in California, so let's say I live in Golita like you. Mm -hmm. If I were you, 
I would walk south to Mission San Diego, and I would walk north toward Mission Sonoma. It just makes sense. Start at your doorstep, you're already on the mission trail. And if I were coming from Washington State to ride the mission trail, without any question, I would start at Sonoma. And a biker, any biker here could tell me why you'd start in the north. Tailwind. Tailwinds. So the prevailing winds are north to south in California. And so I can tell you from personal experience, I see a uh, one of these. Part of it. There you go. Or the but north you are. The north let me tell you, in the Salinas Valley, you do not want to be caught going northbound in the afternoon. <laughs> and um, I rode an e-bike, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I could watch my battery go like this as I headed into the wind. I never ran out of battery north to south. I ran out of battery four times in 14 days going south to north. So, at least in my experience, I would personally choose to ride north to south. The other advantage of north to south, when you're along the coastline, the cars are going this way and the beach is here. If you're riding south to north, there's a lane of traffic between you and the beach. And a lot of this is pretty new beach. So to me, that's another advantage from north to south. Mm -hmm. Also, if I were walking, do it any way you want. The book is written north to south, but I believe, and Missions Trail Alliance agrees, if your last day is a stretch between Petaluma and Sonoma, it's not our nicest day. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Mm. It's on the highway. And we'd love to, we'd love for the um, Sonoma County Trails Council, if there exists such a thing up there, to make a trail from Sonoma to Petaluma, it's countryside, but to walk there is on the highway. If you compare that to this 90 mile stretch from um, San Clemente, or really from San Juan Capistrano and Dana Point, south to San Diego, it's a better experience. We want people to end with that wonderful experience uh, like we would have by following the coast to Mission San Diego. And um, we know, for instance, on the Via Francigena, it runs from Canterbury to Rome, Bishop, Archbishop Sidgwick who recorded that, recorded it from Rome to Canterbury. We figured out it's better from Canterbury to Rome. That's the way 99% of the pilgrims walk now. And so we feel that's the preferred way. But the funny thing about maps, you can read them both ways. And the book is full of 88 maps at one to 100,000 resolution. If you look at it, you can, in some cases, make out buildings. And um, if you start south and go north, you just start the back of the book. And if it's hard for you, draw an arrow. <laughs> and then you can follow the map going that direction, too. Mm. Other questions? Yeah. Best time of the year. Best time of the year? Mm. I would say try to avoid July. And August <laughs> and the weather's perfect year-round in Santa Barbara right mm -hmm. except today <laughs> you know, what someone told me it's the first time in a year and I want to take full credit for bringing <laughs> the weather from Seattle <laughs> to Santa Barbara but I wouldn't uh, choose to walk in July or August mm -hmm. in the Salinas Valley stretch or the inland stretches, because you, what was, um, what was Lockwood store temperature at when you were there in your car, 
mark that day. The last time I was there was 112. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So you want to avoid that for your own well-being. And I've done it in the spring and in the fall, and that's okay. I believe you could also do it in the winter time because up here in San Francisco, they also have Seattle weather like we had it today, and that's kind of year round. But up in Marin County and Sonoma, it's, it's very nice in January, and most of this. It gets better as it goes south, so mm. winter could work as well. Okay, with no further questions, if you'd like to buy the book, I'm happy to sign it. And I just want to say thank you for coming out tonight. I'm excited about this trail, and it's cool to be in on the ground floor of it. I hope you'll either walk or bike 800 miles, or, like many people, you'll decide to start one mission to another mission. Start here in Santa Barbara and walk a ride to Ventura. You've begun it. And you may very well be hooked and want to do the whole thing. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much.